Good morning to one and all present here. It gives me immense honor to welcome you this morning to a talk on Tibet, India, and Asia by Dr. Lobsang Sangye, Honorable Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration, organized by the Department of International Studies and History in association with the Committee on Public Policy and Governance, School of Law, and the Deanery of Humanities and Social Sciences. I invite Dr. Lobsang Sangye, Honorable Sikyong, Central Tibetan Administration, Father Benny Thomas, Director, School of Law, and Professor Sindhuja Iyengar, Faculty of Political Science, Department of International Studies and History, for the auspicious lighting of the lamp. honor to invite Dr. Lobsang Sangye to address the audience. Being tall, I need to always lift this little bit. Good morning. It's not loud enough, actually. Even though I had a lot of idli and uh, this morning, and my favorite masala dosa, I'm fully stuffed and feeling sleepy, but still I have higher energy than you all, it seems. So let's start with good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm not sir, I'm just, just good morning is good enough. Um, to all the law school students in the ground floor, and uh, political science students on the upper floor, balcony. Yes, I don't know which one to rank higher, law students or the political science? I think law students are larger in number. And I also have law background. And, and I, have a, I have a grudge, grudge against political science because when I went to Delhi University to get admission at, uh, in political science, I was not given admission. <laughs> so I got admitted in English literature, and grudgingly, I spent three years studying Shakespeare and all those people. And then finally, I went to law school, campus law center in Delhi University. So with respect to political science, I think you are in an elevated state. That's good. Um, but I have a law background as well. But you can ask me tough questions, though. And also, it's a great honor to be here at Christ University, mainly because, as I was just sharing with uh, Sindhuja Iyengar, who kindly introduced me, um, and uh, Dr. Benny, because I myself went to St. Joseph College in Darjeeling. And my wife went to uh, St. Joseph Convent and Loreto College. And my daughter also, who's in the States, she also went to St. Clemens, so a lot to do with Catholic schools. Um, so a great honor and privilege uh, to be here. And I am asked to speak on Tibet, India, and Asia. But then let me start with my personal background. I grew up in Darjeeling in a small village. Uh, because uh, as Sindhuja mentioned, uh, my administration number one priority is education. And personally, I am standing here mainly because of education. Because after uh, Tibet was occupied by China, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and 80,000 Tibetans had to flee to India. And here in India, we settled ourselves. And I grew up in a small village between Darjeeling and Kalimpong. If you know, Darjeeling is known for tea. Actually, my hometown is next to a tea garden. So all my winter vacation, and I went to Tibet refugee school, Winter vacation, I used to cut grass for our cows, cut wood for our home, so I know how to clean cow dance. Um, and then obviously, studying in Tibet refugee school, we didn't have much facilities per se, uh, not auditorium of this size or the facilities at all. Uh, 
um, sleeping in double deck uh, bed without windows per se, without glasses. And Delhi, Darjeeling tend to be very cold. So I've studied actually under street lamps because of a lack of electricity at times. So having studied through the refugee school, refugee camp, I went to St. Joseph College, then went to Delhi University, Hansraj, then the campus law center where I did my law, then got Fulbright scholarship to go to the US and did my master's degree at Harvard Law School, then did my doctorate degree, and I was appointed fellow and senior fellow. So I spent 16 years in the US. So I got elected in 2011, and then obviously I returned to incredible India, and I exchanged Starbucks coffee for masala chai, which I had three cups this morning, and exchange dharamsala, which is quite cold at this time, without central heating, with uh, good facilities in the US. Because why? When you come to India, you get peace of mind. Each time I return from the US to India, when I land in uh, Delhi airport, as I get out of the airport, when you get the air, you put the adjective, how you define that? Okay, the Delhi air. <laughs> Obviously, it's a bit unpleasant, but mentally, in your mind, you just say, aha, uh -huh, I'm back in India now. <laughs> this is India, kuch bhi ho sakta hai. Uh, some people liked it, yeah. <laughs> so especially when you nowadays, when you go from Delhi or Bangalore, when you climb up the mountains in Dharamsala, when you see this Dolada range, the green forest, fresh air, you can't beat it. So I'm sorry to say to Bangalore also, Dharamsala is beautiful and air is pure. So you all are welcome to come to Dharamsala anytime. So the education being number one is now having gotten education and, uh, and uh, when the Tibetans elected me uh, to this position, I felt First thing I should do is encourage younger generation of Tibetans to study hard and be a successful professional and successful uh, Tibetan. So I'm glad to see our many of our younger generation Tibetans are sitting in the front row here. All most of them are wearing traditional dress. Thumbs up to them. Those wearing not traditional dress, I'll not give thumbs down, but a neutral thumb, because every Wednesday. I wear traditional dress, Tibetan traditional dress, mainly because inside Tibet there's a movement going on called Hakar, White Wednesday. Wednesday is auspicious day, mainly associated with the Solonese Dalai Lama. Inside Tibet, Tibetans wear traditional dress, eat traditional food, visit monasteries. So Wednesday is eat Tibetan, think Tibetan, do Tibetan, wear Tibetan. It's a kind of nonviolent resistance within Tibet and spreading all over in solidarity. I wear traditional dress every Wednesday, and whenever I see younger generation of Tibetans wearing traditional dress, and women are norm normally 100% uh, traditional dress, I give thumbs up to them, so good to see them. Now, to, on the topic, Tibet, India, and Asia. So I'll briefly cover geographically, then spiritually, then historically. Phases of relationship between Tibet, India, and Asia. Then the implication also will be similar. In place of geography, environmental implications. Um, in place of spirituality, I'll come back to that. Uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual achievements, rather. And uh, geographically, uh, the historical part, I'll come with geopolitically, the implication that's facing in Asia, India, because of Tibet. Now, geographically, if you look at the map, I'm sure there are some who has geographical background. The very Tibet, or the whole of Himalayas, originated 70 million years ago, at least 50 million years ago, because of the continental collision. The Indo-Australian continent moved, if I recall, 15 centimeters per year onwards 
and collided with the Eurasian plate. And then you can see formation of the Himalayas as India, this plate collided. And then the whole of Himalaya or the Tibet, is still, even today, is moving a couple of millimeters a year, still inching upward. Hence, the whole of Himalayas is considered, is recognized as the youngest mountains in the whole world. So you can clearly see geographically, the Tibet became the roof of the world. It's 4,000 plus meters average. Happened, occurred, because India collided with that continent and the formation of whole of Himalayas and Tibet. So hence, Tibet is the highest, it's called the roof of the world. But along with Tibet, the whole of Himalayan belt, from Sikkim to Ladakh to Arunachal, all the Kashmir, all this range came about of this geographical collision 50 to 70 million years ago. So geographically, we are connected. So hence, now when we say from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from north to south, it all happened 50 million years ago. And because of this, we are linked. And then quickly move to uh, spiritually as well. As we all know, <clears throat> Buddha was born in Lumbini. Now it's in Nepal, but consider an Indian king and a prince at that time. Then Buddhism flourished all over India and it spread across the continent. To, till 13th century, Xinjiang, one of the provinces now, was a country before, was a Buddhist, all the way to Afghanistan. That's why you have Bamiyan Buddha statue even in Afghanistan now. All, all, all over Asia, and also Buddhism came from India, through North India, through Nepal, to Tibet as well. So hence Buddhism, the Buddha Dharma from India, spread to Tibet in 7th, 8th, 9th century. Now, Tibet takes great pride in saying that the best preserved Buddhism, Buddhist text, Buddhist teaching, is in the Tibetan language. And hence you can see spiritually also we are linked that way. Now historically, obviously now we can go quickly go to great game between Russia, British India, and China was played out at that time. They were essentially great game of these empires was over major part of Central Asia, particularly Mongolia, Afghanistan, and Tibet. And Xinjiang fell in between. So in that great game, we can clearly see outer Mongolia became part of Soviet Union, Inner Mongolia became part of China, and later Outer Mongolia is now an independent country. Xinjiang became part of, was occupied, it became part of China. Tibet was also occupied. And then you can clearly see it's playing out even now, the Bhutan, Nepal, uh, and then Afghanistan. Even now, after decades of war between Russia, America, and the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, you can clearly see it's being played out even today. Why? Because now specifically, it was geopolitically, Tibet was vital. Uh, so was Afghanistan and uh, uh, Xinjiang. Because of occupation with Tibet, and it has a lot of implications since then for whole of Asia, particularly for India. Now, historically, I'll link, then I'll come to environmental uh, the implications. For example, in 1914, similar convention was signed. Now I'm trying to bring some law here because we have law students. Similar convention was signed between British India and Tibet. At that time, Chinese government sent its representative, its ambassador. They initialed the similar convention the draft of the convention, but did not sign it. And Chinese were objections, they, they had objections, more on the border between China and Tibet, 
not on the border between India and Tibet. So on the sidelines, similar convention was signed between the Prime Minister of Tibet, independent Tibet then, and British India. And on the sidelines, two agreements were signed. One on border, and it's called McMahon Line now, which is the preferred border for India. But China does not accept that. And on the sideline, another trade agreement was signed by, between Prime Minister of Tibet and British India, which was to be renewed every 10 years. Now, this will kind of reveal how shrewd or cunning and long-term thinking Chinese does and how Tibetans and the Indian government were taken for a ride and has major historical implications even today. Now, in 1914, trade agreement was signed between British India and Tibet, which was to be renewed every 10 years, and which happened. 1914, 24, 34, 44. All these times, it was renewed between Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, and, B and Delhi. But in 1954, after the independence of India, Pandit Nehru, with his non-alignment mo movement thinking and forming an alliance with all the Asian countries, thought that he should renew the trade agreement with China. So he sent his representative to Beijing. After six months of negotiation, they came back with Panchil Agreement, the famous Panchil Agreement we all know about. Now, if you look at the Panchil Agreement, I think all the law students and the political science, you should look in the Panchil Agreement. The body of the Panchil Agreement is essentially the trade route between India and China, India and Tibet, that's it. There's not much about uh, peace of Asia or nothing like that. But the preamble had five points. In the preamble, they put five points and call it Panchil. So at that time, India boasted that no, finally we have Panchil. Panchil is a Sanskrit term, so hence it's an Indian idea of the agreement. But China signed another Panchil with Burma. And China thereby saying, it's our idea. We signed Panchil with our neighbors. But in 1954, when the Panchil was signed, India wanted it to last for 25 years. China wanted it to last for five years agreement. But in the end, they negotiated a lot. In the end, they agreed to last for eight years. Now here it is, political science students. 1954, the Panchil was signed. China wanted it for five years. India wanted it for 25 years, ultimately signed for eight years. 1954, after five years, what happened in 1959? Chinese army occupied Tibet. After eight years, what happened? War broke out between India and China, 1962 war. So you see, China planned this all along. They said five years, they had a plan to occupy Tibet, perhaps move into China, uh, India as well. When they negotiated it to last for eight years, after eight years in 1962, they did exactly what they planned, planned to do anyways. And interestingly, one general, Indian general, told me, we have to find out whether it's true or not. <clears throat> in 1959, after Tibet was occupied by Chinese army, Chinese government asked Indian government for a permission to open the Calcutta seaport so that the Chinese government could provide the supplies from sea route to Calcutta, from Calcutta to Sikkim to Tibet, to provide supplies to the Chinese army and the officials in Tibet. And India opened Calcutta seaport for Chinese government to provide all the supplies for the army and for the officials in Tibet. So in 1962, a war between India and China Chinese army had more supplies than the Indian army. So you can clearly see how they plan all these things and execute it. 
facilitated by, unknowingly, most likely, by the Indian government. So from 1911, because when you define state sovereignty, we define having a territory. Tibet had fixed territory. Because if you look at the map of China, Han Chinese China is only one fourth of China. Rest of three fourths of China is actually Tibet. Tibet is as big as California and Texas combined or Europe, Western European Union. It's 2.5 million square kilometers of land. 1,000 kilometers north to south, 2,500 kilometers east to west. It's a huge tract of land. And if you include Xinjiang, if you include Mongolia, all other quote-unquote ethnic groups, Chinese, are Chinese, Han Chinese inhabited area is one-fourth, at most one-third. So when you look at the map of China, so why I say this is Tibet was geopolitically vital in that great game because Tibet was lost. It has major implications now. Before India, the second largest populated country in the whole world, and China, the largest populated country in the whole world, did not have a border connecting each other. The, the armies did not see eye to eye. Once Tibet was occupied, the buffer zone between India and China, or whole of South Asia, was removed. Chinese army has moved right next to India from Kashmir to Arunachal Pradesh. And hence, the ongoing claim over Arunachal Pradesh, the Ladakh, the Aksai Chi, is ongoing. The intrusion of border areas are ongoing. Because the agreement, the McMahon Line Agreement signed between Tibet and India is not respected and followed by the Chinese government, and there is an ongoing intrusion. Now, not just that, the story has not ended. Now, you, know, you have a seaport in Sri Lanka built by Chinese army. You have seaport built by Chinese government in Pakistan. And they're, they're trying to build one in Burma as well. And their presence in Nepal is huge. Most likely, the, the most powerful embassy in Kathmandu is neither the US embassy or the Indian embassy. I think it's Chinese embassy now. Once you remove Tibet as the buffer zone, the influence and interference of Chinese, it's ongoing even, even now. So hence, when you talk about Tibet, we always say it has security implications to India. Now that's from geopolitical angle. So there's a historical connection with geopolitics. Now environmentally, Tibet is also vital. Now because the roof of the world is also considered holy place for many of the Hindus because the Mount Kailash is in Tibet, Lake Mansarovar is in Tibet. Often I say, we Tibetans are seeking refuge in India for now, but we Tibetans have been giving refuge to Lord Shiva for centuries. Now, environmentally, Tibet is vital for India and Asia. Now, in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, every year, especially this year, there's a headline newspaper over the sharing of Kobri River. How much, who, who should get how much? I think it's a small potato compared to rivers of Tibet. Tibet is the source of 10 major rivers of Asia. Satlaj River starts in Tibet, flows through Kashmir to Pakistan. 
Indus River, the cradle of Indian civilization, starts from Tibet, flows through Ladakh, Kashmir to Pakistan. And you often hear about India and Pakistan talking about water sharing of Indus and Southwest River. Sometimes we Tibetans would like to say, excuse me, actually that origin is in Tibet. <laughs> we are the source. Brahmaputra River, from Tibet to Northeast Assam to Bangladesh. When I went four or five years ago, people in Northeast, especially in Assam, were not that much interested on the issue of Tibet. This year I went, just a few months ago, I was surprised to see so many TV cameras and so many news media wanted to know my views on Brahmaputra River. Why? China has finally agreed that they, they have actually built a dam on Brahmaputra River and they are planning to build more. And suddenly, people in Assam has realized that Brahmaputra River has been receding for years and Brahmaputra is the lifeline like Kovru River in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Lifeline for Assam, lifeline for Bangladesh. If it recedes, millions of people downstream who survive on agriculture, who survive on fishery, the green belt of Assam is through Brahmaputra River. Salwin River, Mekong, the famous Mekong River, Irrawaddy River flows from Tibet all the way to Southeast Asian countries. Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, all survive on these three major rivers which starts from Tibet. By the way, nowadays when you see, you know, uh, bottles of river, uh, bottles of water being sold and charged, sometimes we Tibetans feel we could make good profit by charging one penny per liter flowing from Tibet. But for centuries, we didn't mind sharing our water with our neighbors. So we let the flow of uh, rivers flow naturally. But now dams have been built. And also to China, the Yellow River, the cradle of Chinese civilization, Yangtze River, the most famous river, because they have built the world's largest dams which generates the highest amount of hydropower. It starts from Tibet. Now, China is not just building one or two dams. They're building 10, 20, 40 dams per river. China, as per the World Commission on Dams, they have the largest number of dams compared to the rest of the world combined. Now, you might see dam, hydropower, simply not so. Dams can be used as weapons during war. Because if you control the flow of rivers through dam, when the people in downstream, let's say in Assam or Northeast or Kashmir, when the water is delayed by one or two weeks, when the irrigation needs it most, Farmers suffer. And when you unleash water, when they're not needed, and unleash in a very rapid way, it causes floods. And it can wipe out villages, roads, everything. And let's say there's a war, and all the roads and villages are wiped out from this side. What would the Indian army get their supplies from? Airlift, which is difficult. So that way, Tibet is vital, not just for India, but for the whole of Asia. And also, as you know, there's good news. In Paris, COP21 summit, the climate summit, just signed an agreement, global agreement, to reduce the temperature to 2%. No, 2%, uh, two, uh, uh, two centigrade, globally. After 2020, they will make efforts. Because why? The global warming is causing climate changes. 
And because of the global warming, the level of rivers and level of ocean is rising. And then making all these island nations disappear. That's the fear. But here also Tibet is vital. One, we all know about Antarctica and Arctic as the first and second pole. Tibet is considered as the third pole because after Antarctica and Arctic, Tibet has the third highest reserve of ice, glaciers. The difference being Antarctica and Arctic, when they melt, it goes to ocean. Difference being Tibet, when the glaciers of Tibet melt, it forms fresh water and into rivers for neighboring countries. Now the bad news is almost 50 plus percent, some say almost 75 percent of Tibetan glaciers, the ice have melted in the last century. If you take 2050, according to NASA, 50% of glaciers of Tibet will melt. In 100 years, 75%, another 75% will melt. That means less glaciers on Tibetan plateau, means less ice on Tibet, means less water for the rest of the world, especially Asia. Because glaciers are the source of all these rivers. Now why I say this is, China has 19% of the world population but only 11 or 12 percent of fresh water. So which means remaining 7 or 8 percent, nearly 400 million Chinese are facing scarcity of fresh water. Now but the problem is, the situation in India is worse. In India, more than 400 million are facing crisis fresh water. Bangladesh, Pakistan, situation is worse. Now if Tibet is the source of water, for Asia, and all these countries are facing water scarcity, and China controls the Tibetan plateau, Tibetan glaciers, if they start building dams, now there's a report as the Chinese government is trying to divert rivers from Tibet instead of towards India, towards China. And logically, empirically it's not yet established, but logically why not? If 400 million Chinese are facing water scarcity, do you think if you are the head of the Chinese government, will you divert, if you, will you let the water flow to India, to Bangladesh, or will you divert to your own people? It's an issue of national security. Hence, many experts say that before wars were fought over land, that was classic colonialism. You control land, you control mineral resources. Nowadays, you have war over oil. That's why you see all this Iraq war and Iran war and ongoing war over control of oil. Soon, wars will be fought over water. I'm sure Karnataka and Tamil Nadu are witness to the high voltage debate between two states. If two democratically elected governments will argue and elections are won or lost over Kobri River, you can might as well imagine what would happen in whole of Asia over all these major rivers flowing from Tibet. And Tibet is vital as far as environment is concerned, including Chinese scientists have said that the jet stream over Tibet, because of the global warming, Glaciers are melting very fast. Presently, there will be more floods because glaciers are melting very fast. Floods in Assam and Bangladesh, the annual occurrence are due to deforestation in Tibet and melting of glaciers. But faster the glaciers melt, a scarce, a water will be in the long run. So hence, as I told you, from geopolitical angle, Tibet is vital from for India's security, for neighboring security, to restore Tibet as the buffer zone. Environmentally also, Tibet is vital, hence to restore the traditional status of Tibet and the Tibetan people as the guardian or the steward of the Tibetan plateau is vital for India, vital for all the neighboring countries. And hence, Tibet is 
important. Now, spiritually, as I mentioned, because we have two monks, representative from Sarah Monastery and Tenshilubu are here. Spiritually, as I mentioned, Buddha Dharma spread from India to whole of Asia, particularly the issue of Tibet. The Indian scholars from Nalanda University were the ones who introduced Buddhism to Tibet. Hence, I'm sure if you go to Belakopi, the Golden Temple or Sera Monastery or Munkot, all the monasteries, everybody says Tibetan monasteries and Tibetan lamas, which is technically true. But historically speaking, all these monasteries that you see are Nalanda monasteries. All the scholars that you see inside the temple are Nalanda University scholars. So nowadays, Modi governments talk about Make in India. So this is Made in India, Nalanda University, spread Buddhism in Tibet. So it's a Nalanda Buddhism spread in Tibet, and we brought it back to the land of origin. So in some sense, we Tibetans made make in India, Nalanda University, back where it belongs. Some applause for some efforts on the part of the Tibetan people. So, in the Nalanda tradition, interestingly, the great scholar, one of the greatest scholars of Buddhism, whenever his Solonis Dalai Lama, he came to Christ University, whenever he gives talk, he always mentions one of the greatest scholars called Nagarjuna. He was from Andhra Pradesh. Anyone from Andhra here? Quite a few, yeah. He's known to be very brilliant. So are, are all Andhras brilliant? Yes or no? So it's considered. And then uh, Shantideva, some say he's from uh, Gujarat. Kamla Shila, I think he's from uh, West Bengal. And one of the most famous, Patma Sambhava, Guru Patma Sambhava, who originally introduced Buddhism to Tibet, uh, is from Kashmir, more from Swat Valley, Afghan. He was known as Afghan or Kashmir prince. So you can clearly see all these Indian scholars bringing Buddhism to Tibet. Finally, so I showed the geographical link, not just link, inseparable link between Tibet and India. So spiritually, geopolitically, environmentally. Finally, I'll end, as uh, Sindhuja mentioned, my election is going on, about democracy, Tibetan democracy that we've introduced in exile. And then we also borrowed democracy from India. But mind you, His Holiness always says, India is our guru, we are chela, we are India's chela. Because Buddhism was brought from India to Tibet. So democracy also, India is our guru, we are India's chela. But when Maduk Shio, you know, sociologist, anthropologist, writer, who came to Dhamsal, who attended one of our parliamentary sessions. And after one hour or so, she came and met me. She said, oh, your parliament functions so efficiently. You're so polite. Because she saw me as I was entering the parliament. I had to seek the permission of the speaker. When he gives me a nod, I bow down, then enter. When I take leave, we all have to bow down before we take leave. When you say one nasty word, you'll be a reference for decades. We are very polite that way. And Madhu Kishore said, you know, I think our Indian parliament should learn from Tibetan parliament. And she tweeted. <laughs> and she tweeted actually that. So I have a witness and evidence and she tweeted. You check her tweet, actually she said that. So we learned from uh, India as well. And then now, my second term election is going on. But talking about the first term election, so our competition, election competition is also quite polite, actually, relatively speaking. Some, some youth are here. When do, those who use social network, Facebook and WeChat and all, they tend to be a bit nasty, you know. So that's the new age coming, creeping in. But rather than generally, we are quite polite. So in the last election, me and the front runner, a good friend of mine, Tenzin Tedongla, 
who was the senior most, who was a former Kalantriba himself. So we had a debate in Dharamsala. But then the next day, our debate was in Delhi. So after the debate, we met and the organizers, and then we chatted. And finally, we said, OK, let's take a taxi to Delhi together. So me and the front runner and the organizers were in one taxi. We drove together to Delhi whole night. So because I had spent 16 years in the US, and even he was from the US. We were both coming from the US. So in the middle of the night, when we woke up, we saw the driver was actually following a good traffic rule, which is green light, drive, yellow light, keep driving, red light, look, keep driving. <laughs> so we were a bit horrified because, you know, <laughs> And the organizers also, they said, OK, two of the front runner candidates, yes, that's the risk. You take one truck, cam, one truck comes and slams you, you're right in the river. Two of the leading candidates for the Tibetan politics is gone downstream. <laughs> so organizers also, I said, what's going on? He said, no, no, this is India, chalta hai, you know. <laughs> the finally, we arrived in Mershungatila around 2 a.m. 2 a. or 3 a.m. And Tibetan being Buddhist, very philosophical like Indian, you know, we talk, talk, the talk, the talk, all these philosophical things, but quite complacent in execution, right? So they had actually uh, not booked a hotel room for the, organ, for the <laughs> candidate. So they were knocking rooms, hotels, at 2, 3 a.m., you know, trying to find a room. Finally, we got two rooms. So organizers took one room, me and the other front runner candidate, we shared one room. So next morning, we were having breakfast together. All our supporters, both sides, were looking at us and saying, we've been arguing as to which candidate is better, and they're sharing breakfast? How dare they? Aren't, aren't they supposed to bicker and fight and shout and throw fork at each other and you know, spoon at each other? We shared a breakfast, and we had good debate. And after the debate, we gave each other camping tips as to how, where to go, things like that. So again, as a good chela, India being a guru, so our recommendation as a chela to all the politicians is to share taxi together, share hotel room together, be polite. So if you're expecting me to say some bitter things about other candidates, other Tibetan candidates, I'm sorry. Political science, no, no. <laughs> and law, law students also, if you're expecting me to file lawsuits against other candidates, sorry, that's not the Tibetan vote. We try to be as polite as possible because we take Gandhi notion of ahimsa, nonviolence, moral values, and try to implement it. We try to uh, practice the teaching of Buddha, Ahimsa, peaceful. And because His Holiness the Dalai Lama is our greatest leader, as per his vision, as per his advice, he wants us to be a true Tibetan. When I say this, as I mentioned, education is number one priority for my administration. I'll end with this. So hence our education policy, Tibetan education policy, is also from class kindergarten to class five. Everything is taught in Tibetan language, not a word of English, except in class four. Why? Because we want to teach our Tibetan in mother tongue. According to UNICEF, you learn better if you teach in mother tongue. Because you speak your mother tongue at home, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your settlement. You just not only understand the terms, but you understand the concept behind, the values behind those terms. But also because, as you teach in mother tongue, we also want to teach our values in education. So that Tibetan children not only become successful professionally, but they also become good human beings. That's our goal. Not only they become modern, English-speaking, 
professional, but they also become traditionally rooted, who speaks fluent Tibetan and a good Tibetan. So that is our contribution to the world. So this is what we have done in exile also. Our education policy and implementation is also quite unique because as much as possible, we want to be a positive contributing factor or an entity in this planet. Because as we say in Buddhism, you are born and you die. Death and birth are two sides of the same coin. No one can escape death. Once you are born, you have to die. But the question is, but in that sense it's very fatalistic, is very cynical. My goodness, I'm born, I have to die. But it's also so liberating from Buddhist point of view. Because you're going to die, no one can escape death. While you leave, make use of it, do something for the world, for your country, for your community. Hence, I got education in Tibet refugee school, lived in Tibetan settlement, went to the US, came back to give back to the community so that I could be part or a small piece of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's vision, Gandhi's message of ahimsa and the Indian ethos of being a generous host and be a good human being. Thank you.